doing all this. And again, you know, I, I just follow the Lord, so sometimes it gets mixed up and just... But anyway, uh, the Lord has worked in my heart about... I, I noticed something here in this passage uh, about the loving one another. And it says here, not only loving one another, but as I have loved you. And, and it just appeared to me that there's something that Jesus wanted us to recognize the disciples by. There's something that we can see, something that they ought to be identified by. And so I'm entitled to just recognizing the disciples of the Lord. And my question to you this morning is, can somebody recognize you as a disciple of the Lord? That's a question, isn't it? That's a humbling question when you think about it. Is the life that I'm living, is the way that I, I, I come to the service, am I rejoicing, am I excited about being here? Can somebody recognize me if they see me out on the streets, if they see me in town or at my home or in the, in the worship service, can they recognize me as a disciple of the Lord? And I want you to think about that as I come down through the Scriptures, and, and I want you to, to, as I'm reading along, read along with me here. But verse 31, it says, Therefore... When he was going out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And so now I say unto you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that you love also, also love one another. And by this shall all men, look at that, all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. How many times is that mentioned? Three times, isn't it? Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. But thou shalt follow me afterwards, Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I, cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? And verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as I think about a message such as this, Lord, I, I want my life to resemble that of a disciple. And Lord, I, I know that these here, many of them have a desire to do the very same thing. Uh, I know that all of us are dealing with this flesh and maybe some shortcomings that may be here, but Lord, I pray you would just open our eyes to the Scripture. Help us to dig into your Word and, and to just soak it in and let it resonate within our hearts. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit do its perfect work and, and, and conform us as you're the perfect workman, just working out uh, certain things within in us, Lord, and, and conforming us into the image of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would just put your finger on something where we've erred and gone from your truth. Lord, put your finger on something where we might be encouraged. Lord, put your finger on something that we might walk closer to you. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would someone recognize you as a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? A student, an imitator maybe, it's as I think of the, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, you know him rather, rather well. In Acts chapter 4.13, the Bible says something in peculiar. It's the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they get together and they see Peter and John and the Bible says they perceived that they were unlearned and that they were ignorant men, right? But they had took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. And so what was it that they took knowledge about that they had been with Jesus? Was it their boldness? Was it that they had the Word of God? Was it this love that we're talking about here? What was it that they took knowledge of being, a, being with Jesus, being a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And if I would ask you if you're a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a disciple. Yeah, I'm a student. Yeah, I'm in the Word. Yeah, I try to live it. Yeah, I try to abide by it. And people should, and they, they, they could identify me as a disciple. Well, what would you say would be the reason that they should identify you as a disciple? What should be the reason? What should be the reason you would, they would say that you're a disciple? Maybe in your private life where you're all, around, all alone and nobody is, is looking except for the Holy Spirit, except for God Himself looking down from heaven. And maybe you're all alone in your home. Maybe you're on the internet. I don't know, on your phone. 
and you're all alone and yet in your private life, I know that God is watching. Could He say that you're a disciple of Him? Maybe in your public life, when the places you go and people you see and how you spend your money in your public life, when others are around you, when you're not at church or you're just out there with the boys or out there with your, uh, your girlfriends or whatever you might call them, and you're just out shopping or doing whatever you may be doing, can people look at you and say, hey, you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a humbling question. It's a tough question. But we need to ask ourselves because that's what I see. And what should we base our discipleship? What is the foundation of that discipleship? I think that it's amazing after all these years. And uh, some of you might get the same thing as I get. I'm out and about and and some person that I don't even know, and they'll look at me and they said, you were in the military, weren't you? And I say, yeah, well, how did you know? They said, well, there's just something about you, your haircut, or something about you that identifies you as a military person. Sometimes it's the haircut. Sometimes it's a mannerism. Sometimes it's just one of those guys. I don't know if you guys always just... Brother Adams, do you keep your, your pants just clean, pressed all the time, and spotless, and folded in one way, and all this kind of deal? But they recognize you according to your language, the way you dress, the way that you act, the way that your hair is cut, just the way that you respond, sir, ma'am. And they recognize you as a military man, though you don't have a uniform on or anything else like this, and and they're able to recognize me as a military man. I think it's amazing sometimes when I'm out and about, and and, and some person, this is few and far between, okay? But they might recognize me as a ministry man, a pastor, not only as a military man, but a ministry man. And and they say, wait a minute, there's something about you. you Are you a pastor? And I say, well, yeah, I do guess. And then they say something like this, and they say, well, you just have a glow about you. And you just have a, a, an anointing, and sometimes when people say anointing, I, I don't even know what that means half the time, because everybody defines that different. And sometimes I wonder if they're just trying to flatter me or trying to get something from me. It's just one of those things I struggle with, okay? But they look at me and they say, okay, well, you, there's something about you that you're, you're in the ministry, you're a pastor, you're, you're, you're definitely a preacher of some sort or another, but we can identify that you are a ministry man. And how would they do that? Sometimes it's the tracks that you keep in your pocket. Sometimes it's the Bible that you hold in your hand. I, oftentimes when I'm flying on the plane, hey, I keep my Bible in my hand. You know, yeah, you know. But uh, anyway, I... Is, I've learned that i got, I got to stay safe when I'm on the plane. But uh, maybe it's the Bible. Maybe it's the tracks. Maybe it's just the way that I dress or carry myself. But they're able to recognize something about me. And I wonder if, if through all this, that they not only a military man, a ministry man, if they're able to recognize me just as uh, an average person, just somebody who's been with Jesus, somebody who's walked with Jesus, somebody who's a student of the world, an imitator of my Savior, I wonder if they can recognize that about me just based off of my actions, just based off of my attitude, how I carry myself. I wonder if they not only say that about me, but as you. Let me ask you, would someone recognize you as somebody who's self-absorbed? You know, you get all alone there, you're at the dinner table and, you're, and your kids are over there just texting along on the phone and you're talking to them and they don't even hear a word that you're saying. And they're so self-absorbed, they don't even hear a word that you're saying. That, is that what's said about you? You're so self-absorbed that everything's about I, 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 me, me, me. It's, it's my world, my hurts, what I'm going through. You know what I'm saying? You can say amen once in a while, Okay. <laughs> A hard-working man just out there just working in the garden, working, uh, cleaning deer, working uh, for, around the house, working in the, in the church and doing all this work. Do you recognize you're a hard-working man? They recognize you as uh, someone who's a rebuke to your Christianity. So I think about the Swains oftentimes and several of the others. You, you know what I'm saying? Are these guys that can go through and endure all kinds of troubles and trials and hardships and and every time you see Miss Ola, she comes up here, she has a smile on her face. She says, how you doing, preacher? How you doing? Can I do anything for you? And I'm thinking to myself, how can I do something for you? Amen. She is that way. And they're constantly here. And I look at it and I say, this is what I want. And it's a rebuke to our Christianity, is it not? Because sometimes I wonder if I can go through trials like that. 
if I got some news that Sarah might be laid up in a, in a rest home somewhere, I, I don't know what I would do. I would hope that I respond in the right way. But it's a rebuke to my Christianity. You see what I'm saying? But we're identified as something, aren't we? You're identified as something. You know, I, I want to be identified as a Christian. I really do. And I, I don't want to be identified as a Christian the way that the, the world terms it because they, they've got it so twisted and so turned. And oftentimes, Christian doesn't even line up to be what a Christian really is, is a, a, a little follower of Jesus Christ, somebody who's Christ-like. And oftentimes, doesn't line up that way, does it? Somebody who calls themselves a Christian. you know. And I think about it. I say, yeah, I am a Christian, but you know, am, am I identifying myself with a Catholic person? Am I identifying with a Lutheran person? Am I identifying with a Method, a Mormon person, a Methodist person? Am I identifying with that crowd? Because I don't want to be identified with that crowd. I really don't. I'm glad that I'm a Christian. I've been born, born, I've been born again. I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That makes me a Christian. But I tell you, I want to be identified as a Baptist. I'm proud of it. And many times we look at the world around us and they say, well, you know, I don't want to carry the name Baptist because, you know, I just want to be turned as a Christian. Well, I want to be identified as a Baptist because I'm trying to follow the Word of God the best way that I can. And I believe every single word that's written upon it says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every single word. And so I call myself a Baptist because I follow this book and I, and I try to live it when it comes to baptism. And I don't believe in sprinkling babies. I believe that we ought to baptize by submersion. Amen. When somebody's saved and, and, and we don't baptize them until they're saved. We don't welcome them into the church unless they're regenerate. Unless they've been saved by Jesus Christ. But I mean, all these kind of things that we do, it's because we base it upon the Word of God. And so I call myself an independent fundamental Baptist because of this. It's not what thus say at the convention, okay? It's not covenant theology. It's not reformed theology. It's, it's what the Bible says. And so I identify with these certain things. And let me ask you this morning, don't you want to be identified as a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Don't you want to be identified with that? Yeah. And guess what? If you're living for the world, how in the world am I going to recognize your Christianity? If all you do is running with the world's crowd, how am I going to recognize it? I mean, if, you, if you're not living a pure life, if you're just out there careless with your lifestyle, how am I going to recognize your Christianity? There are certain things that you just automatically identify and, and you look at some people when they tell you that you're a Christian, you're just like you're shaking your head, you're scratching, you're like, what? How did that I mean, are you sure? But the number one mark that he gives us here, Christianity ought to be demonstrated by love one for another. Because he, that's what it gives us here. Christianity ought, to, Christianity ought to be more than just a confession, but a lifestyle. It's a life that's lived with some convictions, and we need convictions, and we need to walk worthy of the vocation. I think of this in Ephesians. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith He's called you. Be followers as dear children unto God. Be followers of Him. And so if you're going to be recognized as a disciple, hey, you must live as Christ lived. You must love as Christ loved. You must be an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you got to do. We must allow Him to live through you by faith, and that's discipleship. Not salvation is two different things. You must be saved before you can serve as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And so what I'm trying to point out this morning, that if you're saved, people want to see uh, what it is that you're following. They want to see, it, yeah, I'm here because Christ wants me here. Some people get in the mind, they're like, well, I can be a Christian and serve God at home. Well, are you tithing? Are you obedient to a pastor? Are you, are you really doing everything that God's commanded you to? No, you're not. I realize that not every saved person will be salt and light in this earth. They may not show evidence that they've been with Jesus or that they're a true disciple. Isn't that a shame? You ought to want to be a disciple. You ought to want to be identified. Amen. With Jesus Christ. That's what we do in baptism. We're identifying with Him. But we want to do more than that just at one point in time in our lives. It ought to be a continual daily ongoing walk that we have with the Lord. And because of Christ, you know what the Apostle Paul did? The Bible says that He turned the world upside down. 
While they're shouting in Ephesus, Great is the goddess Diana, what is the Apostle Paul shouting? It is great as the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us from our sins. Great as the Lord who stood on that old rugged cross and, and died in my place to just for the unjust that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Great is our God who didn't stay in that grave, who has risen again in that right hand of the Father of whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. And because I know that my Redeemer liveth, I'm going to continue to live through Him as He lives in my life by faith. Amen. That doesn't mean that I'm perfect by any low shot of the imagination. But the Apostle Paul turned the world upside down because he stood for something. And sometimes when you love people, sometimes you've got to rebuke them in love. Sometimes you just got to point them in the right direction and say, turn away from those idols and start turning unto God. What are you doing over here? You don't belong in this crowd if you've been saved. You don't belong over there. He reasoned with Felix that in a prison of righteousness and temperance and judgment, persuading them to turn to Jesus in faith for the remission of sins. Love will do anything it can until Christ be formed in you. In John 14, 12, Jesus said, He that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Love is an action. And you're constrained, you love is a virtue, the highest moral standard that there possibly is. It's a life of purity. Jesus said, Be holy for I am holy. Well, that's what God says. Love is a mark of discipleship. And we've been going through John chapter 13 for some time now. And as we started out, we looked at the love that the Lord has shown us. There in John chapter 13, verse 1, remember me saying that Jesus said, I have loved them to the uttermost, to the farthest extent, to the greatest possible extent that there is to love. And He showed us this love that we're to have one for another. When He got down on His hands and knees and feet, and he began to wash one disciple who betrayed him. He began to wash another disciple's feet who would deny him three times as we see here at the end of at verse 38. He begins to wash the other disciple's feet who he knows that once he goes to the cross, all men will be scattered from him. And they say, yeah, Lord, we're going to stand with you. And he shows them love. He's done all this in Judas a man who betrays him, he gives him a position of, of privilege, a position of honor, sitting right next to him in the Lord's table. He be, dips in that sop and gives him the bread and showing the great love that he has for Judas. As we look at the end of John chapter 13, I want you to see specifically what characteristic that the disciples of the Lord are marked by. Now we get to verse 34, and really that's the main theme of this, this, this whole message for, for me. And how did it come to that? Well, because he knew that he was going to be separated from them. He knew that he was going to be taken up. He knew that he would be in heaven and they were going to be on their own. And so he, it gives them a distinction. There was a separation. And then there's an impression that he wants to leave upon their hearts and minds as I've walked and as I've loved and as everything that I've shown you in this life, this is what you need in your life. There's an impression. And then there is an expectation of discipleship. So... I want you to see this as we come down through. Where does love start? It's hard to imagine embracing a cross when you know that you're going to be rejected. Knowing you're going to be mocked. Knowing that you're going to be ridiculed. Knowing that, hey, these guys don't care about what I'm doing. They don't understand what I'm doing. But I'm doing it because I love them. I'm doing it because it's God's will. I'm doing it because... Then they don't understand. He says, By my knowledge shall my righteous soul, or shall my righteous servant justify many. In Isaiah 53. And when you think of Corinth, we get to the great love chapter, but before all of that, you see all the division and divisiveness. You see people who are proud and heady and high minded. You see all the trouble, all the carnality of Corinth. But we come to 1 first, first Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of the Bible, we begin to learn what love really is, don't we? Love is long suffering. It means it's just no matter how many times you've been hurt, you're still there. Love is kind. Love is not prideful. It's not puffed up. Love doesn't behave itself unseemly. Love is not selfish. It doesn't seek her own. Love is not provoked. It doesn't think evil. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. And it says at the very end that love 
never fails, right? Many times, I'll be honest, sometimes my love fails. And this is the love that, that, that Jesus Christ wants us to, to demonstrate. And when I look down to that list of everything that love is, I see it in my Savior. I see it demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ. And here is what He's trying to put within our hearts. John put it this way. God is love. It's in His very nature. It's in His very character. It's just who He is. And Jesus didn't get upset when Judas was in the process of betraying him. The love that compelled Jesus was a love for the Father. Psalm 40 says this, Then said I, Lo, in the volume of the book it is written in me, I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. He was compelled by the love of God, a desire to see people saved as trophies of God's grace. Again, Isaiah 53. By his righteous soul, by his knowledge, and my righteous servant justify many. I, I know that's not the exact words, but that's what he said. Uh, Fifty three eleven. You can look it up. He should take your sins and should judge it in his flesh, dying in your place, the place of whos- the whosoever wills in this world. Right? Whosoever will come and let him take the waters of life freely. Whosoever will believe on me, and you give you eternal life. Whosoever will. This is who he's welcoming in to his food. Now, whosoever wills. But he desires to see people saved. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. We just sung it. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. But he took our place. Love says, Thy will be done. There's no greater love than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus says later on in the book of John. And he says in our text, Now is the Son of Man glorified, right? For him it was settled. It hadn't happened yet. He hadn't gone to the cross yet, but it was already settled. Now, presently, today, already, it's already accomplished. I want to do His will. I know it's hard. I know it's... That's one of those things I want to do, endure a lot of suffering, a lot of ridicule, a lot of pain. I know what I want to face, but I'm going to do it. It's already settled in my heart, already settled in my mind. I'm going to do it for you. A disciple of the Lord will take up his or her cross. That's what he says. You know, do you remember he says, take up your cross and follow me? Taking up your cross requires a lot of work, doesn't it? Taking up your cross requires sweat. You gotta get busy. You gotta work hard. You need to take up your cross. It requires a lot of sacrifice. You know, brother Larry. When it comes to taking up your cross, hey, you gotta lay everything down. We want to take up everything that we can and keep it in our possession and hold on to our lives and and keep living for our own self. But taking up your cross and following the Lord, it says, you know, "My right, my right is not my own. My life is not my own." This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That's what it says. And so there's sweat, there's sacrifice, there's service to keep on, keep it on. There's focus. You know, follow the Lord. Take up your cross and follow me is what he says. And so you keep your sight on the Lord and where he goes. That's where I'm going. That's how I'm going to accomplish God's will. Yeah. Then it takes steadfast faith, knowing and believing that's what He wants me to do. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you going to be a disciple? It's not going to be easy, but it'll be blessed. And so He addresses them as His little children. Jesus looks at them and He calls them little children. He hasn't said that before. It's something that actually is only really found in the book of John and in 1 John. Over and over, John uses this term that he gleans from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Little children... It's a term of infection. Affection. He speaks with tenderness. He speaks in a way to kind of get your attention. He's never spoken this way before. Little children, as a word that only a father could say if you're, you know, Brother James, you know, you, you children, they, they, you know them as little children. They know you as daddy. He's calling them little children. He's saying something here. When I think about the Scripture, I think of what the Lord is going to do. He knows that He's going to be separated from His disciples. He knows that He's going to heaven. 
He says, where I'm going, you can't go. And some of us might think, well, Peter, James, and John might be thinking, well, he's going to go take over the kingdom. He's going to go set up his throne, and, and after he gets it set up, and then I go and be with him. That's not what he's saying. You and I, all these years removed, we might pull back and think, well, maybe he's talking about the cross. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to heaven. That's one place that you and I can't go unless we've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, unless we've uh, received the, the, that sacrifice of our Redeemer. Knowing that His righteous blood is going to sanctify me, it's going to save me, I can't go to heaven without that. And this is what He's talking about. I'm going to a place you can't go right now, and I know that you want to go, and I know that you don't understand. It's like the other day, Friday, when I left the house there with not this past Friday, but Friday before last. And uh, I'm going outside the house. My son doesn't know what's going on. And I know that I'm going to get on a plane. I know I want to go to this pastor's conference. And I know that I want to be going uh, a long period of time for a little two-year-old. I mean, days is like eternity for them, okay? And I'm going out the door. And I love my son for all God's world. And I know that he loves me. And I he knows that I'll do anything in the world for him, but he doesn't understand. And, and some things, you just got to say, you know, I love you, son. Come give me a hug. I'm coming back. I, I'm not going to stay gone for a long time. I want to be there. Sometimes when you're in the military, I think of, and, and it's sad when, when, when the little kids and the wife were left back by the, in the home country. Sometimes they got support groups they, as well they should. And they don't understand why their daddy or why their husband are off in the foreign field taking up weapons and people are shooting at them and everything else, wondering if they're actually going to come home or if they're going to lose their lives on the battlefield. They don't understand, but somebody's got to go and stand. Somebody's got to go and fight. Somebody's got to keep... I mean, if nobody goes and fight, how in the world are we going to stay free? We won't. We won't. But they don't understand. It's necessary for them to go and fight for us, for our freedoms. It's necessary for Jesus Christ to go into heaven. But He's not going to stay there, is He? And fathers, you love your children. It says in the book of Luke, in reference to prayer, that is, if a son asks a bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, or will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask Him? Right, amen. Though He's going away, we know that He's going to give us something very precious, seal us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. But it's something that we struggle with, doesn't it? Sort of like uh, I associate it with this because I've, I've been to so many funerals those who you know that they've been saved by the grace of God and, and you don't I mean you see the suffering and the pain before you see them slip out into eternity and, and there's much weeping and mourning and of course I understand 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we want the sorrows those who have no hope if they've been saved and born again we know that they're going to a better place we know that they'll be with the Lord to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and one day he's going to capture he's going to rapture us up out of this earth and we're going to be with him but the fact of the matter is it's hard I uh, lost my sister when she was just uh, she was 25 or 27 years old four little kids I lost her that was hard and when you lose family members when you lose loved ones it's hard there you know that you're going to see them again there you know that they're coming back it's hard for the disciples though they know he's going to return the Lord's absence Jesus is saying hey I'm going to a place you can't come right now but I want to come back again. I want to come back again and receive you unto myself. Jesus prayed a high priestly prayer in John 17. He said, praying unto His heavenly Father, praying unto God, as Thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And Jesus is going to the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us, for you, for me, continually. He's up there praying for us. He's up there. Uh, I mean, He just wants us to succeed. And he has a purpose for us being here. And what is that purpose? 
He says, as, as I've sent you into the world, talking about Jesus Christ, as God is in this world to come and redeem us, Jesus said, as you've sent me into this world, so send I them into the world. What is the purpose? Yeah. To tell others, that's right. <laughs> to be a witness. To tell them about the love of Christ, which, I mean, blows my mind. To love us while we're yet sinners. To love us while we're contrary to Him. To love us and even though we're not living the way that we ought to. As in California, I heard a message that kind of, I'll be honest with you, it gripped my heart. It's a message they entitled My City. It took it from the book of Lamentations. And it showed there at the very beginning in the very chapter 1, verse 1, where Jeremiah calls uh, Jerusalem. He says, The city. And he goes over to chapter 2, I think it is, verse 51. And he calls it My City. And how God had to rekindle that love because this is where God has Jeremiah at this point in time in his life. And though nobody's turning to him, nobody's listening to a word that he's saying, though he's preaching his heart out, though he cares for every one of them, and though he goes to every single baby baby dedication, though he goes to every single wedding, though he goes to everything that there is to go, and he loves these people, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, his heart breaks. He's weeping. He sees the destruction, and though he tries to reach him with the gospel, nobody's hearing. Even his own family is turned against him. He begins to lose heart. Begins to lose heart. And sometimes your pastors lose heart, don't they? Well, I determined that day. I said, Lord, I'm sticking it out. Lord, I'm staying. I don't care how hard it gets. You've called me to this city. I'm sticking here. I'm staying here by the grace of God. You know, I was, I was over there and I was thinking about how am I going to win my city? How am I going to do it? I mean, you got Lutheran churches everywhere. You got a great big Methodist church everywhere. You got people who don't even go to church. I said, well, I'm just going to win them one door at a time. And I said, I want to try to get that tent ministry up, up and going again, Brother Bill. And Prosperity Hopping and some of the other places. I want to do it because I want to win my city. I don't want to see him die and go to hell. Right, man. The Lord's absent now, but, but he's coming back one day. He's coming back very soon. And what then? It's too late, isn't it? It's too late. Now I want to get into the thrust of the message. You say you don't have very... Uh, but the thrust of the message, So now I say unto you at the end of verse 33. So now I say unto you become very important words. So let's look at the impression that he sits, sticks his disciples with. We see the Lord, the words of the Lord. He says, "A new commandment I give unto you." Now, I don't know if you're like me, and you begin to think about it, and you say, "A new commandment." What was the old commandment? Was the old commandment when He came out to reach His disciples when Peter, James, and John were out there mending nets when they're uh, fishers of men? I mean, and He calls them and He says, "Drop everything, boys, follow Me, and I'll make you fishers of men." Was it that? Was it Micah 6 8 when he says, Do you justly love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? Was it that commandment? Was that the old commandment? Was it in Deuteronomy? When he says, Keep my commandments and live? It's not, is it? The old commandment is listed right here within the text, isn't it? That you love one another. I just preached on it at the beginning of the year. Two great commands. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus, Leviticus 19, uh, 18, I believe it is. Where it says, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord, and to love one another in this way. I mean, everybody will recognize it. You could go to a rabbi and they would tell you the same thing. This is the whole duty of man. And love one another. Love, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it was a common knowledge. In fact, the great Hillel was asked by someone if he would teach them the, the whole sum and substance of the law in just a, the, the quickest space of time. And they asked him, well, what is it? They began to tell him, he told him in the negative. Normally we would say, just do unto others you have done unto yourself. But he did it in the complete opposite. Don't do to others as you wouldn't have done unto yourself or something like this. This is confusing. Just do unto others as you had done unto yourself. Do unto others you had done unto yourself. But he said this. He says, this is it's only interpretation. Now go and learn. Paul said in Romans 13, verses 8-10, through 10, 
He says, Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law for this. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So it wasn't a new commandment. It was an old commandment. To love one another, but what makes it new? That little tag that he puts in the, in the end, isn't it? As I've loved you. As I've loved you. It's one thing that... I think of all the Pharisees who, who knew all about taking care of those who were poor in the street and what he would do is they would pass by and they know they're supposed to give to the poor and so they'll just toss money in there and didn't even care less about that poor man. He was walking by the way. They didn't care less about the, the lame, the, the halt. The, I mean, they, they didn't care less about him. They just did all that they could do just to fulfill the law and just kept on pressing on. And Jesus begins to take it to a whole new level. He does that quite frequently. So he that looketh, as has been said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you, he that looketh at a woman hath committed adultery already in his heart. He lifted it to a higher standard. He looks at the scribes and Pharisees, everybody's so, so fascinated about their righteousness and everything that they could do. And Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And so here again he tells us, uh, when you love one another, love as I have loved you. As I've loved you. No other time in Jewish history would one approach a leper to heal. This didn't happen. Yet when Jesus comes off the Sermon on the Mount, a leper comes and meets him there at the bottom, and he extends out his hand, nobody would come and touch him. But Jesus healed him. A man who's, I mean, he can't get up and walk. He can't do it. He's palsy. He's let down to the roof. Can't do anything. It's Sabbath day. Nobody would lift a finger to help this guy. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath day. Everything that Jesus does, I mean, you think about the disciples themselves, rough fishermen. I mean, when, you, when you're talking about fishermen, we think about the military being rough. These, these guys were fishermen. I mean, they had the language and everything to go along with it. They were, they were a rough crowd. The tax collectors, they come from every area of life. And yet these are the people that Jesus chose to be his disciples. When everybody else would have turned a blind eye to him and said, Get out of here. You're not qualified to learn from me. You're not qualified to have anything to do with me. He accepts them as his disciples. That's love. He lifts it. When we think about the Samaritan woman, when nobody would come and have anything to do with her, she's all alone at the well. And Jesus speaks to her. He says, I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. Are you speaking to me? He wants to reach her for Christ. He wants to see her saved. He wants to see her brought home to the glory. She straight away goes and she testifies. Come and see a man and tell me everything there was to know about me. I think of the disciples who are thinking about how many times Peter says, How many times do I want to forgive my brother? He says, Seven times? Seventy times seven. You think how he elevated marriage. You look at the, 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 the Pharisees where they said, he, we, we ought to divorce for every cause. Jesus said, Well, God had joined together, let no man put asunder. He's elevating everything there is to elevate and puts love on a whole new different level. Jesus elevated service above status. George Truitt. He tells of a young little boy. He accidentally got shot by his uh, little neighbor kid. And I guess they were out hunting. But this kid got taken to the hospital. George Truett got word. He goes and he drops everything, lays it to the, to the side. He, he runs to the hospital and he sees this little boy. His father's there. His father's all drunken and all the people. I mean, he's in a drunken stupor. The boy uh, is surrounded by two doctors. The doctors come up to George Truett and he tells him, he says, this boy's not going to live. He's not going to make it. The father there, he's drunk. He can't talk to the father on account of his drunkenness. He comes back the next day. He's starting to sober up. And, and he hears the little boy trying to whisper something in his ear. And, and the father leans over. He hears what the, what the little boy says. He says, Daddy, he says, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. And, and there are all the times you've been drunk and all, all the things you've done, I still love you. 
I still love you. The father says, son, it's going to be all right. You want to make it through. It's going to be okay. And, and, and he's just emotional. I, I would be emotional in that same kind of instance. The little boy's trying to say something else. He, he looks at him and says, Daddy, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And then long afterward, the little boy passed away. And, and the father goes down. He's talking to George Truitt. And he says... You know, how in the world? He said, I, I want to I wanna clean up my house. This boy loved me despite everything that I've done, everything in the world. And I've been a horrible father. I've been a horrible husband. I've been horrible in every area of my life. I just wanted to turn around. I wanted to see God do a miracle. He says, how, how can I deny a love such as that? My boy would love me so much despite what I've done. He says, I got one better for you. How about a God that loves you so much despite what you've done? You come down to die on the cross for every one of your sins. How about that? The man got down on his knees and he got saved by the grace of God. Jesus said to love as I've loved you. Love as I've loved you. Let me ask you, how has God loved you? What has He brought you from? What has He saved you from? I, I know. I know I know me. I don't know you. Okay? I know how much He's loved me. And it's more that I could pay back. It's more than I could ever do. I don't even try. I just want to love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. But he says, love as I've loved you. I met a man this weekend, this past weekend named Bill. Bill worked for Delta Airlines and he was just a jet engine mechanic and and this is what he spent most of his, his career doing. And he's out there, he's working on the jet engines. They would send him off to school. He would learn how to do sheet metal. He would learn how to do cabinetry and all these other things. And, and at the, toward the end of his career, the pastor looked at him and said, Bill, why don't you retire? Why don't you give up your job? Why don't you retire and come work for the church? He prayed about it and eventually did. And uh, he told me, he said, they were leasing buses at the time. They had several buses that were running. And, and uh, he said, he sent me out to go purchase a bunch of buses. That was his first job. He purchased the buses, brought them back to the, the, the shed there where we do maintenance. He was head overseer of everything. And he began to do everything that he had learned there. He says, it's an amazing thing. Everything that he had learned as an airplane mechanic, working on the engines, working as a, uh, putting on the cabinets, and everything and everything that he had learned there at his job, he said, little did I know God had been preparing me for this my whole life, and I didn't even know it. The man was just, I mean, he was broken. I, was, I said, you all right, Bill? He says, it's just, when, when you see what God has done, you see how he's ever he's been doing this my whole life and I didn't even realize it several times I, I look at my life the skills that I was able to, to learn going to industrial maintenance class and several other things I was able to learn I was able to use it in the ministry even even brother cook I know you do electricity you're able to use that for the ministry should we ought to show love one to another he says man he, he told me he says the thing that thrills my soul, God has given me this ministry. And though I'm not out there and, and doing everything else, I'm not preaching, I'm not singing, but the buses that I help fix, the buses that, that I help put on the road, hey, they're shipping so many bus kids in here and they're getting saved left and right. What do we do for the Lord? What can we do by the grace of God? How will we allow us to serve? He saved us to serve. It says in verse 15 of the same chapter, for I've given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. Can I ask you, where's your love? You know, humility and love are not weaknesses, but strength from God. And this command so impacted the Apostle John that he says this in 1 John chapter 3. He's called the disciple of love. But 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 14 says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the Lord hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life. And you notice the order there. 
Because uh, when, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and we got saved, we identify in the likeness of His death. We've been buried in the likeness of His death. We used to walk in newness of life. And so the order from death unto life that He gives because we love the brethren. And he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What are you doing for the Lord? So one characteristic is listed, lifted to a higher level than everything else. There's one thing Jesus wants you to do is to love one another. And the result will be others will recognize your discipleship. He says, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples. You know, I realize that no matter what trade that you're in, whether you're uh, a mechanic or whether you're going, working at a hospital, people recognize what school that you go to. They, by certain things that they do, they, they would recognize a rabbi by, according to his disciples because a rabbi would spend his whole life, for, well, not his whole life, spend multiple years following a rabbi. They would give up all rights to themselves. They would submit to whatever the teacher was teaching them. Whatever his interpretation, they would try to learn it. They were surrendered to, to, to what the rabbi had to teach them. And so they gave up all rights to themselves for a whole, however long that it was. And, and they would sit and learn and observe and, and glean from the rabbi. This is what the disciples are doing. And maybe some were known for being great, great teachers of the law, like Gamaliel, for the apostle Paul. Maybe some of them were known for having this interpretation or that interpretation. Guess what? We ought to be known for loving one another. Jesus said, this is how we ought to be identified as those who love one another. There had to be a deep desire to emulate the rabbi. Jesus says, they shall all men know that you're my disciples. Jesus was the expression of God's love. Now the disciples were to be the expression of that love in His absence. You say, how do I do that? I have to be submitted. Crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And there it is, it's that faith that we ought to have. And people have a hard time identifying you as a person whom Christ loves. Why? Because you live for yourself and not for God. Oftentimes that's what it is. We say, well, you know, I've lived for him long enough. Now I can go out and do my own thing. They have a hard time identifying because your love for the Lord is dying. And so let me ask you, can you face trials with grace? Can you serve with gladness? Can you esteem others better than yourselves? Can you forgive as Christ for your sakes has forgiven you? And then the biggest question here is, can others see God's love through you? You know, I was coming to the end of Bible college. You sit there and you go through four years of training. You study a lot of books. You look there and you... I mean, you know all the right answers. You've been giving it to, it, to you and... And you sit there and you start feeling, yeah, I know. I know all about this in my apologetics class. I know all about this in Christology. I know all about this in, in, in systematic theology. I know all about this. In, and I tell you what, I did good while I was in school. Well, well this is something that's completely different when you put it in practice, isn't it? <laughs> you get out to Sanford and, and you look at people and they have problems. I mean, we all have them. I have problems, okay? You say, yeah, amen. We know we have problems. But you look at a man who struggled with his, his, his daughter, his two daughters, and, and you said, you're supposed to have all the answers of a young pastor, and, and, and she's got this rebellious spirit within her, and, and you look at the parents, and, and you look at them, they confess that they have problems, okay? The one guy says, I know that I'm angry, I try to control it, but you should have seen my parents like that. And you should have seen this situation that was, and you should have seen this and that and the other. And every excuse under the sun. You know what? I didn't have every answer under the sun. This person needs to identify. He, he needs to deal with his own problem before his kids when he run. He needs to deal with his head, but one anger. But how in the world am I going to convince him? He needs to deal with his anger for his kid to get right. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I can't make one. You deal with people who say, 
you know, I've been hurt by a pastor so and so, and, and, and you know, I don't know how to get over it. This guy knew more Bible verses than you ever know. You know, he, he's been saved longer than I've been alive. He knows everything that there is to know. And what am I telling him? I said, brother, you know, I can't guarantee you I'm not going to hurt you. And I don't want to, and I don't desire to hurt you. And I want to do everything that I can to help you, but I can guarantee you there's one person who's not going to hurt you. There's one person who's not going to let you down. He's going to love you unto the end. That's what the Bible says. Amen. If you keep your focus on men, you're always going to be hurt. But if you keep your focus on God, you can't go wrong. Right, man. We need to fix our focus many times. You know, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Right. You need to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You say, how do you do that? You need focus. Jesus, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, But whoso keepeth His word in Him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in Him. And is getting into the Word of God every day as a soldier receiving His orders, you say, yes, sir. Once you say, that's what I want to do by the grace of God helping me. You know, Brother Bill, you ever defy orders from your commander? It's not a wise idea, is it? But many times we defy the orders of the Lord. You always say, yes, sir, thy will be done. And no to your flesh. And it's easy to say, again, easy to say. Something entirely different to do. But you need to get into that Word and every day into that Word and you continue to live it by faith that Holy Spirit can form you into the image of Christ. He takes control of your life and people begin to see Jesus in you and they'll see His love through you because Christ cannot help but to love people to Himself. And then the disciple has a home beyond the skies. Whether I go, you cannot follow me now. Now is the most important word for me because I know my Lord's coming back. Amen. I know He's coming again one day. The Lord's not cast us off forever. He's given us a problem. He's coming again. Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and He shall stand on this earth at the latter day and though after the, my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. That was the hope of Job, the oldest, <laughs> one of the oldest books that were ever written. The Apostle Paul, he, he begins to uh, write to the book of, he begins to write to the church of Thessalonica. He tells them five times in five chapters of the first Thessalonians that he's coming again. That was their hope. And he says in First Thessalonians 1 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And this is the sweetest message. Of course, my Lord was the first fruits. He was the first. And He's going to bring us up with Him. And Jesus is coming again, but always think about that verse in Luke 18, 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall He find faith on this earth. You ever think about that, Brother Coon? When He comes, will He find faith on this earth? Will He find people working for Him? Will He find people loving Him? Will he find people doing what he asks us to do? His will be done. Will he find us watching? Will he find us as vessels of his love? He's coming again, descending from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And, and I know that we'll meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We can find that in Scripture. And he's preparing a home for the saints of God. You know what? I hope you'll be there. I hope you'll be there. I hope that you're watching. I hope that you're waiting. I hope that you're busy. You have a bright and glorious future as a disciple of the Lord, and our light afflictions are but for what? For a moment. They're just small in comparison to eternity, but when He shall appear, it'll be worth it all. And then the disciple has a yearning to be with his Lord, his fervor. Peter asks, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? Uh, and of course, Peter says all kinds of things, but you can't blame him. Well, he just wants to be with his Lord. Do you want to be with God? Do you want to be with Jesus? I know you do. Peter just wanted to be with his Lord. He just, he just wanted to be where he was. You can't blame him for that. 
Paul said, for I'm a straight betwixt two. You know, that word betwixt, I think that's where they got the candy bar twix from, right? You know, it's twix between two, the two little cookies there. I'm a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Are you laboring for the Lord? The lesson's over. You can read this book all you want to. The lesson's over. Now is the time to live it. Now is the time to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Are you looking for the Lord? Busy being about your Father's business, are you longing for the Lord? I want to be with Him. And His desire for you is to love one another. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to bring this to a close. What are you going to do for the Lord? Will you be obedient to the love of Christ that constrains you to witness for Him? You say, brother, pastor, I know my love hasn't been what it ought to be, and maybe the Holy Spirit has put a finger on some point, some part of your life, and you say, I need to get some things straight this morning. I need to remove some sin out of my life. I need to renew my love for Christ, that dying love that I have. I need to get busy for the Lord while the time is short. I'm talking to the Christian this morning. You say, Pastor, there's some things I need to get settled. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Amen. So number two, for the person without Christ, He died for you. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I understand that. We're all sinners. But Christ died for you. Somebody had to pay the penalty and Christ took that for you. Without it, we'd all be in, a, in the devil's hell. We'd all be there with the devil and his angels. What was it intended for us? And all you have to do is, is not by works. You, you can't work enough. You can't do enough. All your righteousness is filthy rags. All you've got to do is say, Yes, Lord, I accept what you've done for me. Believe that he's God in the flesh. He went to the cross, dead, buried, three days in an old, old tomb, and they rose again on the third day. You say, Pastor, I want to get saved. I want to know that I have a home in heaven. If that's you, would just slip up your hand? Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for these here this morning and for their patience. Lord, I pray you do a work in their heart. Help us to meditate on your message in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Hymn number 332. 332, channels only. 332. Give you a moment to respond. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love lay hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Amen. Brother Coon, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for Jesus that he paid that price for us and we couldn't pay for ourselves. Father, thank you for the day that you came to dwell in our hearts, know that we accept you here. I do pray, Father, that the one in our midst today is not sure that they might make it sure for us eternally too late. I pray, Father, we thank you for our home safely. Give us a good day. Bring us back to the next time. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. You know what change the car? Huh? Here? Yes.